Hi and welcome back to NA Turbo. So I thought I'd just do a bit of a uh, video this morning on the Peugeot, my daily drive at the moment, the RCZ. So uh, if you've been watching us for a little while now, you've seen this come on to the channel in replacement for a Jag XF I had. Um, and I might have intimated in the last video that it's actually now going to be leaving um, our little fleet of cars here. So really I just sort of wanted to do a uh, I guess a final video on it, the good bits, the bad bits, what I like, what I love, um, just in case there's anybody out there thinking of getting one, and they are fantastic cars. So uh, just in case uh, you didn't see that video, I'll give you a bit of background to this. So uh, this is a Peugeot RCZ uh, on a 61 plate, so 2011. Uh, it's the two litre, as you could probably see, because I've uh, left it warming up. Uh, apologies to Greta Thunderbird. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a two litre HDI diesel. Uh, it's putting out about 163 brake horsepower in this guy's. In terms of the RCZ lineup, I think I've sort of covered this when we had a quick look around it before, but they did variants um, of the, air, the different engines. So there was this two litre diesel, various guises of 1.6 turbo petrols ranging from 150 horsepower all the way up to the fantastic R1, which is something like 300, I believe. Uh, BHP, which is just a flying machine and not quite sure how it puts the power down because these are front-wheel drive, they were never four-wheel drive cars. Um, the RCZ is sort of widely known for being the French TT effectively and I'm a big VW fan as I've said before but the reason I went for this is compared to in my view to the equivalent um, sort of TT of the same era, this thing is just so much more of a looker just the you know the lines on it you know and, and for me as i call it um uh not politically correct but the arse cheek rear roof as you can see there with its scalloped roof um down to the panels the way it looks at the back uh we'll also put the spoiler up in a little while so you can see so it's got the active spoiler uh this one's had quad exhaust fitted which were i believe a dealer fit option but you could also get tuning companies to do it which I think just sort of, sort of finishes it off. This particular car's in the grey. I forget the actual name of the grey at the moment, but it's got the also the optional 19-inch uh, sort of dual-colour rims on there, uh, which were also an option. This car's got the JBL um, upgraded audio, which came with a, a flip-up sat-nav and everything, which we'll have a look at inside in a little bit, which is... The JBL system is fantastic. I mean, this car's sort of, what, 10 plus years old now and the sound quality is just awesome. Uh, so, excuse a sort of general diesel rattle, but we'll just take you around the front of the car. Um, so yeah, even from the front, it's a good looking car. And again, you can see the sort of scalloped roof to it. Um, you know, as we sort of look around the front, it is very low slung car. This car hasn't been lowered at all. Um, it's still absolutely standard, um, but it is, if I can sort of pan down, very low slung, you'll sort of, uh, you know, you may have, as I have had issues with particularly low curbs before. Um, but yeah, it's, the, the main reason I got it was just because of the way it looks. This thing just looks so fantastically awesome compared to what else of Coupe sports cars was around at the time. Um, so, you know, that was one of the main reasons, that and the, the absolutely gorgeous interior. So this one's got the light Nappa leather on it. Um, so, one second, let me just uh, turn off the audio in the car and I'll come back to you so we don't get any YouTube copyrights. Right, there we go, we're back folks. So uh, yeah, just turning off the music they had on in the car so we don't get any YouTube copyright violations. But as I was saying, you can sort of see this has got the cream Nappa leather to it. It's very soft and supple. I mean, this car's done 106,000 and it's actually worn, uh, apart from sort of some of the wear you see here, it's actually worn very well, even down on the bolsters. Um, the leather is heated and electric. Uh, on this and it's even got if the camera will focus and pick up on it a bit alpha-esque the Peugeot logo sort of emblazoned into the seats there um, it is a four-seater but if I can pan in you'll very much see it is definitely only a two-seater um, a child seat esque may fit in there but nothing else um, so just sort of panning around the interior 
Uh, also, you've got leather down here on the door cards, pillarless glass, obviously. Um, and we'll just activate the spoiler so we can finish our look around the outside. So the spoiler does automatically come up, but you've got um, two stages to it. So the first stage, which you don't see out the back, comes up about 50 or 60 miles an hour. The second stage, if it came up automatically, you'd be breaking UK speed limits because I believe that's about 90. Um, but you can activate it with this switch here where if I point it to the back, you may just see it pop up there. So I'll take you back out and bring you back around the back here. So there you go. That's with it in, in full sort of exposure mode, if you like, um, on the spoiler there. So yeah automatic sport it's got quite a decent boot size for this thing i think i may have shown you that before um but we'll just head inside and get out of the cold weather a bit and have a bit of look at the cab and then i can tell you sort of why this car is actually departing um so here we are inside the uh, cab of the rcz so <laughs> it's a very nice place to sit um very nice dials Love the flat bottom steering wheel with RCZ emblazoned on it there. Six speed manual box in this one, but they did an auto as well. Um, there's the pop-up nav system, which has uh, nav on it. They did stop doing updates in about 2016 for this, so I upgraded it to the latest ones, but you know, you can sort of see there. Um, and radio as well, turn that down. <sighs> So you've got dual zone climate here. Um, Peugeot of this era, as you might have heard, many sort of motoring people say, was it a case of they took a button gun and basically fired it randomly at the car. So things aren't always in the place you'd expect, which is kind of one of the peeves I've got, but you, you know, you can sort of work your way around it. So um, this is the audio CD system here, which has DVD that you can play through it, which I haven't actually tried, but um, before the car departs our mind. There's the phone system, which is Bluetooth, but you could have also had a, a SIM card in it as well. Uh, SD card slots there. Um, yeah, heated things there as well. Handbrake on the left, which is a bit annoying. So we'll now get into sort of some of the oddities, or as uh, uh, one of the other YouTubers I follow, Hubnut calls it. Um, uh, yeah, because French. Uh, so some of the switch gear is not always in the place you would expect it. Obviously, you've got indicators and everything in there. You've got uh, cruise control uh, on here, on stalks behind here. And then you've got another audio one that hides behind there. Not too bad. Been better if it was on the steering wheel, but hey-ho. Um, then you've got the sort of various um, other switches as well. So um in terms of things that are not quite where you'd expect the stalk here that you'd expect to take you through the trip is the voice activation slightly random um you can also get your trip information but it's down here on this little sort of control panel here so not quite where you'd expect it not the most ergonomic but the thing i find the worst actually and we'll, we'll just hop out quickly for it in terms of ergonomics uh, excuse me jumping out is electric seat controls fine you can feel your way around those same with the memory functions but the heated seat switch is here why <laughs> just why Peugeot may seem you know they're thinking maybe behind it's close to the seat but when this door is shut here it comes right in you cannot take your eyes off the road while you're driving and you cannot easily feel this switch so you do end up i've sort of come to feel where it is now but even when you do you've got no idea other than the feeling on your your backside for want of a better word in your back how hot it is because you have no ability to see these um sort of markings on here when the door's shut and you're driving so yeah that's kind of uh one of the, the sort of peeves that's a bit like why peugeot <laughs> um so we'll jump back in um there isn't actually many other peeves that I've, I've got with this car that really irritate me, to be honest. Uh, the ride, that's a, a slightly different question. Now, these are based on a 308 chassis, um, which is a very good chassis, but the ride is very, very hard. Um, made particularly worse on this particular model because it's got the 19s with the lower profile tyres on. 
and the state of the roads in the UK now makes even the softest car bounce but yeah in this it hurts and you think god I'm gonna break something or you know something when it hits some of the potholes and you're not speeding you're just going at the normal pace um so yeah the the ride is probably not one of the best for current roads if you're on a motorway god it's perfect <laughs> um the the only other thing is um and this is my view on it is if i jump out we'll have a bit of a look at the car from the outside so it's it's a very good looking car but you probably can't get this on camera it is a very wide car so you think kind of the home for this would be on you know sort of back lanes country roads things like that uh, apologies for the car coming past um but you tend to find it doesn't fit very well at all on country lanes um specifically on the ones i've been in recently which were um up in the derbyshire dales or um, around the cheltenham cotswolds it, it feels very wide and big on it so you can't really enjoy it as a sports car i guess because you're very aware of just how wide it is and you know perhaps maybe if we look at the back you might get a better a better sort of view of it but you, you then become very aware that it, you know unless you've got a proper sweeping road where you can see and you can clip some of the you know the other side of the road it's it's really hard to sort of have fun with it on tiny country lanes and that's not just a criticism level that this car obviously cars have got bigger for safety requirements so it, uh, but compare it sort of you know we're going back a few years but rado the corrado who's over here compare it to that or the the tomcat which you can have real fun throwing around on the country lanes because they fit this less so so yeah it's that's kind of one of its its downsides i guess um in terms of reliability if we sort of move on to that now one of the reasons i'm i'm changing this car is it's the 163 brake diesel which comes with a diesel particulate filter um and a fluid which in french terms is either called e-oils from peugeot or fap in renault terms which is sort of a precursor to to add blue and all that sort of thing now i've recently changed jobs and i'm working from home permanently so general traveling around i do in this car will be about if i'm not you know driving it to work will be about 20 to 30 maybe 40 miles maximum a week and with any modern diesels and anything like that it is not good for them to sit specifically for that longer period of time and then just be driven short journeys you're going to get the clogging up of dps it will use more of the eors fluid which actually i think is the better system because in a Peugeot 4S7 had previously had a similar system and that didn't actually need topping up with e-oils until well over 130,000 miles I think it was but it is quite expensive I think even back then so many years ago it was sort of 400 pounds don't quote me on the prices because this was a while ago um but yeah it's it's not going to do it any good it's going to use more of that e-oil fluid it's going to clog the DPF and then you're into a world of pain and I love the car. People have said to me, why don't you keep it and then just sort of take it down for a blast down the motorway, you know, once every weekend or something like that. Great, it, that's not a problem if you've got the time, but the problem is I've got the, the project cars on, I've got family, um, and it's, it's just not realistic for me to be able to take that time every weekend to actually be able to go out and do it. So that's the kind of uh, the main reason i want to get rid of it not because of any mechanical issues it's had which we'll touch on shortly but for that reason now i've spent the money and done the bits on it it's actually too good a car to just sit there um on the driveway and just go into a decline and people say yes you can modify them and you can you know ddpf it and you know take it out in the software and all that sort of thing one it's not really ethical to do that I, you know that things like that have been done in the past so i'm not passing judgment um but it, may above the ethics it's the time and the expense it would take to do that and it's too good a car again to do that with it's best left as it is standard but with somebody that can actually use it as it's meant to be used you know if somebody's commuting in this two or three times a week even 
fantastic. The thing returns brilliant MPG. You know, on a, on a 40 mile trip to my work previously, it's got around sort of 60 miles per gallon. So, you know, for a car this size with this sort of horsepower, it's it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good, you know, fuel economy. So <coughs> that's not the, so that's really why it needs to be with somebody that can use it and, and use it, you know, fully. Um, people have also asked why I haven't gone to the petrols because they did do petrol ones. Uh, this may cause some consternation above from the RCZ owners that are out there and the sort of clubs, but reading up on the petrols, looking at what they suffer from, I didn't, the reason I chose the diesel in the first place was because I'd read up on the foibles and the issues they have, and I just didn't want to get into that. You know, you're talking timing chain slipping, um, with, the, you know, and it's got a, a version of a Vanos system because it was dual, um, uh, development to believe of BMW and so you know that's all into the thousands of pounds I've seen and read stories of people you know, having spent thousands on them and then it's still not right um, and I don't have that sort of money just to for want of a better word chuck away at it if I was keeping it as a project car or as a museum car fine and it was a car that went out on the weekends but this was a daily reliable car so yeah, that's, that's the reason I didn't go for the petrol, you know. Otherwise, if the petrols had been of a standard where I knew it was going to be reliable for me, I'd have just switched to a petrol one of these because I love it that much. Um, but sadly, they're not. Um, and also, having sort of looked around as well, the, I'm actually going back to uh, a leased PCP car. Now there's obviously pros and cons of each, um, you know it's effectively like renting so you're you're throwing a monthly payment away each month but what i want now is having got the projects and as you can see we've got a few in the family um and also i personally suffer from anxiety and when this was off the road for a little while because i was having to do the brakes um and then the injector seals that was no good for my anxiety levels at all because when the injector seals, when I particularly needed it to get to um, a first day of a new job, I, you know, that's, and then had to sort of scramble around to try and get it into a garage and then use one of the other cars. And yeah, it, it was just not good for anxiety levels. Plus, uh, these are going to get quite niche. So keeping it on the road as it goes on is going to be more costly. And again, not great for my anxiety levels. So I've gone down the dreaded route back for a new car and a PCP, mainly because I just want something I can get in every day. When it breaks, throw it back at the dealer and get them to fix it under warranty. Um, and uh, part of the deal I've got includes servicing. So when it needs servicing, I don't have to think about doing it myself when it's a freezing cold or peeing it down day. I just book it into the dealer and off it goes. So that's what this is going for the the new lease car won't be featured on the channel because it is just a means to an end it's a car to get me um about every day um so yeah that that won't be featured on the channel but at the moment this is an idea where it's traded in for less than it's worth if i'm honest i have had it up on various forums to sell because i would like it to go to somebody that's going to enjoy it but um you know when i came to sell the jag last time and this is by no means sort of degrading everybody that buys cars out there but the amount of wasters and time wasters and just people in fantasy land makes the whole process so stressful and again for somebody like myself that suffers from anxiety that is not a good combination so you know i'm going to take a loss on this trading it in at the dealer but at the end of the day, it's less anxiety for me. It is up for sale and um, I will drop the, my, uh, the channel email address down in the comments um, section for here. So if you are interested in it, um, just drop me a message um, and we can sort of have discussions from there. It's not being traded in until March, so uh, there is time. But yeah, that's, that's the sort of main reason. But that's the only reason I'm selling this car. I didn't envisage changing jobs. This opportunity just sort of came along and it was working from home otherwise this is a fantastic commuter car and i would have kept it um so yeah the the rcz has been fairly short-lived it's it's been a year uh it'd be a year in april i would have had it um but you know it's had its challenges and a lot of them don't get me wrong i'm not necessarily the car's fault so i bought this from a dealer it had been sat previously the previous owner traded it in for petrol because he wasn't doing the miles again 
Um, so it's tend to suffer with that thing of if you're trading it in, you're not really going to keep on top of the maintenance of it. You're not going to do the things it necessarily needs doing because you're trading it in. Um, also, it's before that we'd had obviously the lockdowns where it, it, I'm guessing it had been sat and hadn't gone anywhere. So some of the issues I had were sticking rear brakes. So um, the caliper had seized on this side, so replaced the caliper on it. Um, fairly new into ownership. Um, the other side had seized, but we managed to free that off, and that's now working as it should. Um, the only other thing that was slightly disappointing, but again was a side effect of it, it being sat, was uh, the injector seal. So these HDI engines are very, very good in terms of reliability. Um, the only thing they do tend to suffer from is injector seals. So um, I think what was added to the cause of this one is because it was sat and doing low mileage, the sort of tar-like, almost tarmac substance you get that builds up from the diesel, uh, it's basically worn away because it's injected at such high pressure. The uh, injector seals, which are little copper rings, it also then added um, to the sort of a plastic collet around them as well. And that had sort of um, pushed up and out. So you, you, as a consequence, you were getting a diesel smell coming through the cab, even when you were sort of driving, not necessarily stationary, but driving at sort of 30, 40 miles an hour on the motorway, you could smell it coming in. It got to the point, it was so bad for me, I suffer from asthma and it was giving me, uh, giving my asthma gyp. So it was a case of this needs to be done. So um, took it into a specialist who I've mentioned before, Chevronics, um, and they replaced the injector seals, a leak off pipe, um, and the little collets that go on it as well. And it's quite a labor intensive process. And the, because the injectors are so fine, if you rush it and take them out, you can risk damage in the ends of the injectors, which basically means you're down on power and you end up ultimately replace a whole set of injectors, which is thousands. Um, so they took their time with it. It wasn't a cheap procedure. It was sort of in the ream of 580 pounds, I think it was, but it took them in terms of labor, well in excess of eight hours to carefully do all the cleaning. The parts in themselves are, are fairly inexpensive, um, but it's the labor it takes. So that's the only thing that was a little disappointing. The thing that was really disappointing, which I wish I'd have seen when I actually bought the car, but it was April, was the air con uh, radiator that's sort of buried in the nose in the front there. It sort of rotted away just from age, and I don't think it had been working fully in the past, um, but it had rotted away. And of course, I put the air con on and could hear the compressor briefly kick in when I went to see the car and it was cold sort of April day so I thought it's working sort of started getting warmer weather sort of um, uh, I think sort of March time sort of later on and it wasn't working and I did get a three month warranty with the car I could have took it back and argued with the dealer but again it was a case of nah it's iffy and so I just opted to have it replaced but actually that was a very good job I think it's cool air they were called um, again, I'm not sponsored by these companies, it's just who I use, but it's a service they offer where they basically came out to the house, diagnosed it on my driveway for me, which cost about 50 or 60 pounds, I think it was, because they tried to regas it as well. Um, uh, diagnosed what it was, quoted me for it, and the whole radiator with them regassing it coming to the house, somewhere in the region of 380 to 400 pounds which for that sort of service on your driveway, I thought was extremely reasonable. And given on these modern cars, it is not easy. So they had to take the front bumper off completely, the headlights had to come out, and they managed to do all this on my driveway, recharge it all within space of about two hours. So I was well pleased with that. But again, it was a little disappointing. Um, other thing I did was stick two new front tires on it because the ones that were on it, they passed the MOT fine, but they were cracked. And at the time I was running up and down, you know, at least 40 miles each way to work two days a week on the motorway, smart motorways with no hard shoulders very often. So I didn't, and these things don't come with a spare tire. So I didn't want to risk a blowout. So I basically took it on the chin and replaced both front tires, which uh, I'm very pleased with. And just in case anybody wants to know, these are folders. Uh, they are very uh, dirty at the moment, so. Uh, are they sport lines? I cannot remember what they call now, but um, yeah, they're, they're folders. I'm very, very impressed with them. Very good in wet and dry. Um, 
and they're also made in Germany. They're effectively a German Goodyear, um, but they're made in Germany, but they are very, very good. Um, and I'd had previous issues with tires that were made in China um, cracking because it seems the rubber they use is absolute garbage. So um, these folder ones were actually made in Germany. That was pleased to see. And um, yeah, very impressed with them. So they weren't the cheapest. They're sort of a mid-range tire, I think they call it. So they're around 140 pounds a tire, um, which when you compare with the likes of the Pirellis and the Michelins and that, they were sort of at 200 pounds. So yeah, definitely worth a look at folders if you're thinking in the future. But um, yeah, I've waffled on enough. So uh, this video is probably well over half an hour now. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to do a video on why it's going, not necessarily fault the car itself, but just a change in my circumstances. But I will have some more interesting stuff coming up soon. Um, more stuff on the uh, Hillman and the Renault, uh, that are Ryan's cars. So yeah, do like and subscribe, it really helps. Um, I've put a post out if you follow me on Insta, um, on there just saying you know for me I'm at 91 subscribers now that's not a lot in the grand scheme of other YouTubers that are out there but if I could get to 100 I'll be chuffed as anything and um, just a big thanks to everyone because I still can't believe something I started as a lockdown project that nearly 100 people want to watch me prattle on about cars to be quite frank so yeah thanks for watching do like and subscribe and we'll see you again soon take care for now